Hello, friends, and welcome to Zionville, begotten in the New Testament. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our great God and our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for being able to come together today and look at a most important and sacred subject. Please be with me as I talk and be with those listening. And if any here still believe in the false gods that Babylon has come up with, such as the Trinity and tritheism and modalism and so on, we pray that your spirit will especially work on their hearts, that they will see the truth from thy word. And we will thank thee in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Begotten in the New Testament. Today, we want to take a look at the words begotten, only begotten, and first begotten in the New Testament. All three together produce only 16 occurrences. Of these, 10 refer to the Lord Jesus Christ, four refer to Christians, you and I, one refers to the slave Onesimus, and one refers to the Hebrew patriarch Isaac. We also want to look at the one messianic use of begotten in the Old Testament in Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. The purposes of this review of the Greek words behind the English word begotten and its variations in the King James Version is to understand the meaning of each word and those particularly that have to do with our Lord in their context. There is so much misunderstanding today concerning his origins. Was Christ always existent like the Father, or did the Father beget him in some fashion at a point in eternity or in time? Is there a difference between being begotten and being created? What does all this do with our understanding of Jesus' nature as the Son of God? Is he God, a lesser God, or merely a creature? Where does Bethlehem fit in? To say that this is important is an understatement. It also affects so many other teachings. So, what are these words telling us? Study and ask your Heavenly Father for more light. He will help the sincere and humble learner. This is an intense word study, so please write down all the references so that you can look over them as often as you need to. This is a redo of an article I did on Facebook in April 2018. I completely rewrote and reformatted it for this video because in the original I separated the definitions for the Greek words from the scriptures I was dealing with, making the meaning and usage hard to follow. You had to jump around. Here, each biblical passage is followed by the subject of the passage, the Greek word and its English transliteration, and then the definition, all in one place as we discuss each one. Much better. The definitions constantly repeated may seem a bit of overkill, I know, but it is necessary so that you can see everything about each verse at once as they are discussed. Let's begin with the six verses in the New Testament that do not have to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. We will first begin with the verses that speak of Christians as begotten. Christians, four verses, two different Greek words. For though, we, for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 15. Subject, Christians. Geneo is the word in Greek. And it's our first word in this study. And it means to procreate, to bear, beget, be born, bring forth, conceive, be delivered of, engender, make, and spring. In this verse, Paul is here emphasizing his spiritual fatherhood of the Christians in Corinth. He has labored for them and brought them to conversion. He brought them forth into the marvelous light of the gospel, and then he and others became their ongoing teachers. Our next verse says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. 1 John 5 and verse 1. Subject, Christians, the word again is geneo, and it has the same definition as you can see on the slide. John clearly says here that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, and if we believe that, we too are born of God. And then he says that if we love God, we will also love Christ. We thus love the Father and the Son, 
as well as our brethren in Christ. Love, then, is all around. The Lord God is building one happy family in Christ this way. Next, we have this. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. 1 John 5.18 The subject is Christians, and the word is Janeo once more. This is a tough verse for many people, not because of the reference to us being begotten of God, born-again Christians, we understand that well enough, but rather the reference which says of us that we sinneth not. Our experience all our lives is just the opposite of that. But John is not talking about all our lives, but what happens after we are born again, or what should and will happen if we cooperate with our Heavenly Father in Christ. We will walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, as Paul tells us in Romans 8, verses 4 and 5. Is this your experience now? If not, get with the Lord about it so that you can do as Jesus said, Go and sin no more, John 8, verses 10 and 11. The good news truly is that we can and will keep ourselves pure and blameless. And finally, our second word. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, 1 Peter 1, 3. The subject is Christians, and the word this time is anageneo, and it means to beget or bear again, to produce again, be born again, be born anew, a compound word from ana, meaning into the midst, among, between, and geneo, meaning to procreate, to bear, beget, be born, bring forth, conceive, be delivered of, engender, make, and spring. Expanding on our second birth, Peter tells us that it is a living hope. Just as Christ, who was truly dead, was raised up to live again, so shall we be. This is our true, real, and living destiny. Next, the slave Onesimus. One verse, one Greek word. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Philemon 1 and verse 10. The subject is Onesimus. The word is Janeo, again. Now, Paul speaks of the slave Onesimus in a letter to his owner. I hate that word, his owner Philemon. He tells him that he, Paul, brought the gospel to Onesimus, thus bringing him to the born-again, begotten experience. He was now more than a slave to Philemon. He was a brother in Christ. So those are the five passages that have to do with Christians in general, you and I, and also one very specific individual, Onesimus. Now we are going to look at another specific individual, the Hebrew patriarch Isaac, who was a type of Christ. The Hebrew patriarch Isaac, one verse, one Greek word. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, Hebrews 11:17. The subject is Isaac, and the word is monogenes. And it means only born, soul, only begotten child, single of its kind. This is a compound word from monos, meaning soul, single, alone, only, by themselves, and genomai, meaning to become, that is, to come into existence, begin to be, receive, being. This is our first look at the word monogenes, and that is filling, as with the type, Isaac, so with the antitype, the Lord Jesus Christ. As the definition says, this is a compound word. Monos means soul, only, unique, etc. And Jesus definitely is, as was Isaac. Abraham and Sarah had only one son, Isaac. He was their only begotten, and his birth was miraculous. And this is the secret of the word which today has the second word of the compound left out of most Bible translations and doctrinal books by the theologians, committees, and multitudes of individual writers. The second word of the compound is genomai, genes, which means to become, that is, to come into existence, begin to be, receive being. Listen to that. This was true of both Isaac and Christ, and in Jesus' case, it happened twice. In eternity past, before anything was created, Christ's origin as the only begotten Son of God occurred. 
Proverbs 8, verses 22 to 26. Then creation followed, Proverbs 8, verses 27 to 31, and that was followed by a stern warning in verses 32 to 36. Christ is a real son from the days of eternity, not a metaphor. Jesus' earthly birth was miraculous too at Bethlehem, and that is his gestation was miraculous when the Holy Spirit of God the Father began the seed germination process of Mary's womb. No human sperm was involved. With Sarah, human sperm was involved, indeed, her husband Abraham's, but the miracle here was the conceiving at their advanced ages. The Spirit of God took care of that, too. When Isaac was a young lad, the Lord told Abraham to sacrifice him on Mount Moriah, an unthinkable thing. But he obeyed, and then the angel of the Lord, Christ, stopped his hand from plunging the knife into Isaac's heart at literally the last second. A ram was then provided by the Lord out of a thicket for the sacrifice. In these things, the type anti type relationship between Isaac and Christ was established for all time. For more on this beautiful story, see my video number 11, The King of Types, right here on this channel. And now you know the truth of the meaning of monog mon monogamous. Don't let lying churchmen tell you otherwise. Don't let them drop the second word of the compound out on you. Call them out. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Satan would like nothing more than for you to continue in this deception on this matter. Send him away. And now, the Lord Jesus Christ. Ten verses, three different Greek words. Watch the progression of these words in order as they are used of Christ. They tell of his origin. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The subject is Jesus Christ, and the Word is monogenes, and the, again the meaning is only born, soul, only begotten child, single of its kind. This is a compound word from monos, meaning soul, single, alone, only, by themselves, and genomai, meaning to become, that is, to come into existence, begin to be, receive, being. Now we get right to Jesus and the three New Testament words that describe him. First monogenes, beginning here. Here John describes a miraculous moment when the Son of God, deity, became the Son of Man, humanity, by the Father's great love for us. This describes his second begetting, the earthly one, so that we too could have a second birth. Let that sink in. It all means perfect sense when you do. Christ was born again so that we could be. And now we are like any types of Christ as we are changed into his image from glory to glory. What an amazing transaction, born of love for us sinners. Thank you, Lord. Next, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. The subject again is Jesus Christ, and the word is monogenes. Now, this verse helps us understand that Jesus came from the Father's very substance, from his bosom, close to his heart. This is not an act of creation, as many falsely teach, but a real begetting or birth of one divine being from another. And yes, God can do this. It's true, friends. And then there's this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16. The subject is Jesus Christ, and the word again is monogenes, once again. And here we have probably the most famous verse in the Bible. Jesus himself, speaking in third-person grammatical language, as he so often did when speaking of himself, says that his Father gave the world his uniquely born Son, the only begotten, to save us from our sins and eternal destruction. Do any of you really want to argue with this? Then Jesus continues, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, John 3.18. Subject, Jesus Christ, and monogenes once more is the word. 
Two verses later here, Christ makes the most important point that belief in the uniquely born Son, the only begotten, as the Bible describes him, is absolutely necessary for eternal life. Without it, eternal condemnation has already been decreed upon the naysayers. Don't you be one of them. See also John 17, 3, Jesus speaking, and 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Paul. Now what does it all mean? In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. 1 John 4, verse 9. Subject, Jesus Christ, monogenesis the word. John here says that our life is dependent on the only begotten Son, not a metaphor. Again, highlighting the importance of the Jesus of the Bible, not a, not a counterfeit from outside of it by the commandments of men. This is so important to understand, friends. Next, Paul tells us this. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Acts 13, 33. Subject, Jesus Christ. And the word this time is Janeo again. The second word as applied to Christ. And remember that it means to procreate, to bear, beget, be born, bring forth, conceive, be delivered of, and gender, make, and spring. Paul, in a Jerusalem synagogue one Sabbath, rehearsed the history of Israel coming down to Jesus Christ. Here he applies begotten, geneo, to his resurrection. This is proper in this context, but the word used here does not only mean the resurrection, as we shall see. In this case, though, it does, for Jesus certainly was delivered of death and made to spring forth from the grave by the almighty power of his Father. Without that, we would have no heavenly high priest, no completed atonement, and no salvation. We will look at the second psalm in more detail later. Paul also tells us of the Father, For unto which of the angels said he, the Father, at any time, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee? And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Hebrews 1 and verse 5. The subject is Jesus Christ, and once more the word is Janeo. Here, God the Father declares Jesus to be his son with himself as his father. And he meant what he said. This is a real father and son. No metaphors here. The theologians are wrong and off base. Those who teach so are in real trouble, except they repent. It was the Father that glorified Christ, as we see in our next verse. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 5. The subject is Jesus Christ, and once again the word is Janeo. And further, the Father says he glorified Christ to be made high priest, Again, the resurrection is referenced as also his entry into the heavenly sanctuary, both from the word begotten for a specific task. Again, don't complain. This is a good thing, an exceedingly good thing. And notice how Christ was already the begotten son when he came into this world. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Hebrews 1.6 the subject is Jesus Christ, and the word is prototokos. This is the third word applied to Christ, and it means firstborn, first begotten. Now here in this verse, we have the two begettings of Christ clearly spelled out by Paul. Christ was the first begotten in heaven, referring to Proverbs 8, before all creation, and then his beginning into the world at Bethlehem. Two beginnings. Any questions? Christ clearly pre-existed his birth in Bethlehem because he was originally begotten billions of years before. He and the Father then became co-creators together long before this earth was even created billions of years later. Ephesians 3 and verse 9. And the last New Testament reference to begotten is this one. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Revelation 1 and verse 5. Subject is Jesus Christ, and once again the word here is prototokos. 
Jesus leads out in eternal resurrection life because he is indeed the only begotten Son of God and his vicegerent. Thus, he clearly also is one and only unique. There is none other. Worship him and his Father. Now, we have seen the 16 instances of begotten and its cognates in the New Testament through the four Greek words used therein. We now turn to the Old Testament and the one use of begotten referring to the Messiah, and it does not mean resurrection alone, as most people assume. In fact, in Psalm 2, it has meant several things before Paul used it of the resurrection of Christ. Uh, he quoted from Acts. He quoted from uh, Psalm 2, verse 7, and Acts 13, 33, as we have seen, clause B. So now we turn to the Old Testament scriptures. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ, one verse. One Hebrew word. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Psalm 2, 7. The subject is Jesus Christ, and the Hebrew word is Yalad. And it means, it's a primitive root, first of all. It means to bear young, causatively, to beget, medically, to act as midwife, especially to show lineage, to bear, beget, birth, birthday, born, make to bring forth, children, young, bring up, calve, child, come, to be delivered of a child, time of delivery, gender, hatch, labor, do the office of a midwife, declare pedigrees, be the son of, woman in, woman that, travaileth, travailing woman. In the Jewish understanding, before the time of Christ on earth, God's son originally meant an unnamed king of Judah, a Davidic king, perhaps David himself. As time progressed, Jewish exegetes began to see in this psalm a description of the Messiah because of the word anointed in verse 2. And by the time the Christian era came, the disciples saw the anointed one as Jesus Christ, which indeed he is. The Jews, of course, have never accepted this unto this day. But in the truth of it, Paul could apply the psalm to Jesus' resurrection from the tomb, meaning birth from the tomb, resurrection. And we all must accept this because the scriptures teach it. Amen. But because the meaning of the psalm meant different things to different people with the progression of time, not just resurrection, those who oppose us in the one true God movement by using these words in only this one sense, these people need to stand down and learn some new things. All of the meanings always have the eschaton, the last days in mind. Psalm 2's interpretations through history keep pace with the movement of prophetic history through time and serve to show people their position in time. Well, at least it shows us in retrospect. And that is how we need to look at it today to see what it has to say to us now with the final events looming. And what it says is huge. It is end-time events, the final eschatology, broadly rendered, in just 12 verses. The whole of Psalm 2 is thus clearly eschatological. Let's read it and then discuss it. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, that's Christ, saying... Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the othermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are they that put their trust in him. Psalm 2. For us then, in the eschatological context of our day, Psalm 2 shows the gathering of the kings of the earth and the heathen peoples, which includes all the false Christians at the end of time, to battle against Christ and his true obedient people, his remnant, during the final movements of prophecy, verses 1 and 2. 
Briefly, we see the unbelievers, including the leaders, standing against the Father and the Son, wanting to cast off their Ten Commandments and other commands. Verse 3. But the Lord will laugh at them and vex them. Verses 4 and 5. And then he says to them all, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Verses 6 and 7. And this is the eschatological times, remember. That's the context here. This use of begotten is yet another usage, therefore, it's still in the future to us, of the Lord Jesus, the Son, taking his kingdom at last. Verse 8, birthed into it. He then destroys the wicked, verse 9, and then a stern warning is uttered to us all about the Father and the Son, verses 10 to 12. The Son is important, folks, the real Son, as also is the Father, the real Father. All of this disproves the theologian's metaphorical son and teachings such as the Trinity and Tritheism. Amen. Now, for a deeper exposition of this, see my video, God's Prescription, Kiss the Sun, number 45, right here on this channel. So there you have it. I hope this has been an eye-opener and a blessing. Let's remember, Jesus is coming soon. Maranatha. Maranatha.